Okay, now the next question no one's going to escape from, where <laughs> it's going to be, and it's a difficult one, it's how do you sequence all these different therapies, second line, third line, and, and beyond, um, and you know, I think it's, you yeah, ask probably four people and there's 10 opinions. What, uh, how do you approach this, Matt? Well, I find it very interesting to see when people actually start therapy in second and third line. I mean, uh, do you wait for GELF criteria again to, uh, before you uh, start second line? Or are you starting when the lymph node goes above 1.5 centimeters? And did you find the relapse uh, based upon uh, CT surveillance or because the patient had a symptom or you felt something on physical exam. Okay, well, what so do you I'm do? Not gonna, I'm uh, what do you do? <laughs> you, can't, you get brought up, you got to answer. Well, I think in the relapse setting, um, it's all about duration of remission. And we don't often do CT surveillance uh, in this population. I use physical exam, how the patient feels and what their labs uh, are, are doing. Um, and if I feel something on physical exam, then I may evaluate that via a CT scan. Um, and then go from, go from there. Um, if the patient comes in and says that's been there for three months and since the last time you saw it, and you know, that's, that may inform, uh, uh, may inform the decision. Um, often I'll let velocity of change uh, um, often dic dictate how long I let them go. Um, you know, we th have this notion of, of the law of diminishing returns, right? Your, your remission duration from the first line to the second line to the third line, that may be, you know, that's maybe dogma uh, in this era of kind of novel, uh, novel directed therapies. Um, I do tend to uh, try to get towards GELF criteria uh, before reinstituting uh, a therapy. But again, it's a, it's a discussion. Uh, and I think if, it's, if it was there all along and now they're progressing, I'm more likely to, to start therapy earlier. Yeah, I, I would also, you know, say, again, it comes down to that specific individual patient and how they've done, what their responses have looked like. But in general, the sequencing has been all over the map. Uh, you could imagine everybody doing it differently, but I think that time is changing a lot now with the emergence of Revlimid and Rituximab in relapsed follicular lymphoma. Um, I'm sure you, you want to talk about that, but I think that's becoming uh, much more uh, uh, available for all of us. Uh, certainly in the United States, now gained approval, uh, and that's probably now going to be my second line treatment in many patients. Uh, very well tolerated, uh, relatively speaking, and outstanding results. Then I'm thinking about other novel agents, and I think that's when the PI3 kinase inhibitors come in again. So I'm still a BR person primarily up front. Maybe at relapse it's going to be R squared, and maybe at uh, subsequent relapse it might be a PI3 kinase inhibitor, and I think uh, Dubalisib or all of these are reasonable choices. I, I totally agree with this uh, situation. So I'm waiting for the EMA official indication of R squared probably at the end of this year, but R squared will will be the, the, the real good second line for this patient because it's active, it's less toxic, and it's possible to use in a, all the different kind of patients. Uh, and uh, second line could be for sure a square, and we can discuss in the future if you include obinutuzumab instead of rituximab. Uh, there were a presentation at the last ASH meeting from the French group, but at the end of the day, as we discussed before, binutuzumab is a little bit more toxic. So r square is really good second line treatment for follicular lymphoma patient. Of course, right now, the third line is for P3K inhibitors, tuvalizib, idelalizib, copanlizib, and so on. So I think that it's important in that to denote that it's in a rituximab sensitive population in second line. So we've all been saying relapse, not, not refractory to first line therapy uh, from that setting. And that's where the obinutuzumab uh, lenalidomide may be interesting and being studied actually, uh, um, at least in the United States it's being studied. Um, you know, and the, the other piece that I would say about lenalidomide is you got to measure the creatinine clearance. A lot of these patients with follicular lymphoma will have a creatinine clearance less than 60, and that would lead to an initial starting dose that would be lower than what was in the study at 10 milligrams. Uh, so I think that that's you know, potentially an important point. Anyway, at the end of the day, lenalidomide is active also in a, if you use a low dose, five milligrams, 10 milligrams. I'm not sure we have the right, I'm, I'm not sure. That, there are so many schedules in relapse yeah. refractory NHL that, that one was chosen and went forward, but I'm not sure that 15 isn't uh, just as an effective as a dose. I don't, you know, right. uh, I have very low thresholds to dose reduce lenalidomide people are responding.
Right. The, the, the dose that uh, is recommended, I think, is too high. It's 20 milligrams uh, a day. And it's interesting that I find, uh, although I don't do really much at all uh, myeloma, th the patients with follicular lymphoma don't seem to tolerate it quite as well at the, at the higher doses as myeloma patients. And I agree completely with you, Pierre Luigi, that lower doses can work very well. I mean, I've had some patients on five milligrams for prolonged periods of time doing extremely well. We've had some, um, some bad rash, cutaneous issues with, uh, with that and then, and, um, you know, you, of course you see it in, in myeloma patients, and, but, it's, but it's, it's different when you're combining with rituximab and, and B-cell malignancy patients.